Hey everyone, it's Tracy, and in this tutorial, I want to talk about blend ranges in Affinity Designer. Now, they're a hidden gem buried in the Layer Studio that are going to help you take flat vectors and turn them into beautiful textural objects. I'm going to be using the desktop version of the app for this tutorial. However, if you're using the iPad version, I will note differences throughout so that you can easily follow along. So let's get started. I'm here in Designer and I've set up a 4K document which will work just fine for my needs. Now, I don't plan to print mine. However, if you are going to print yours, make sure that you set your DPI to at least 300 and size your canvas to the largest size you plan to print because we are going to be working with texture, which means pixels. I've also pulled in some wood texture from the stock studio. I just typed in wood fence and pulled this one in from Pixabay. I've locked it into place in my layer studio just so I don't move it around. And you can choose whatever texture you'd like for yours. I've chosen this one because at the end of the tutorial, I'm going to take these flat vector letters and shapes and show you how I would use blend ranges to create a weathered paint effect. So I wanted something that had some nice knots in it, as well as dark spaces like you can see here between the planks and finer texture. So let's talk about what blend ranges are and how they work. Most of the time, you're going to hear blend ranges used in conjunction with Affinity Photo. For those of you coming from a Photoshop background, blend ranges are Affinity's version of Blend If. They're used in photo compositing and enhancement, but here in Designer, you can use them to take flat, flat vectors and create really cool textural effects. And that's what we're going to talk about in this tutorial. Blend ranges allow you to control how the tonal values of a source layer blend with the layer or layers beneath it. Now, I know that sounds a lot like blend modes, but this is actually an even finer adjustment. Using blend ranges allows you to adjust the level of opacity from opaque to transparent of all of the tones within both the source layer and underlying layers. Let's take a look at an actual example so you can see what I mean. I've created these two vector squares. One is pure white and one is pure black. And we're going to take a look at how blend ranges will work on these two objects especially against the wood background. I'll start with the white square. The blend ranges can be found on the desktop version under this little cog at the top right of the layer studio. For those on the iPad version, you'll click on the layer, click the three dots at the top and go into layer options and you'll find blend ranges at the very bottom of that panel. Now, I'm not going to focus attention on the very top of this dialog box just yet. I really want to focus on these two graphs. The left side is going to impact your source layer. So in this case, the white square that I have selected. The right graph is going to impact the underlying layers. So this wood texture. In both cases, the left node here and here impact any of your dark tones or shadows. The right node here and here impact any of the light tones or highlights, light on the right. No matter what you have selected or what your underlying layers are, that's always the case. The dark tones are on the left and the light tones are on the right. With this white box selected, if I click and drag down on this left node on the source layer ranges, you can see nothing happens. And the reason for that is this is a pure white box. There are no dark tones. If I click on the right node, however, and pull down, you can see that I can change the opacity from fully opaque to fully transparent by dragging down on the node. Now, if I add nodes in between here and just start dragging around, you can see nothing happens. The reason for that is that no tones exist past this right node. It's a pure white box. Now, let's take a look at what happens with the black box. I'll go ahead and click on the layer. And for those of you on the desktop version, you'll note that I didn't need to go back up to the cog at the top right here, because as long as you have the dialog box open, it'll automatically switch to that layers blend options. For those on the iPad version, you will actively need to click the layer and go back into layer options. All right, if I drag down this time on the right side of the source layer ranges, you can see nothing happens because this is a pure black box. There are no light values. If I click and drag down on the left side, I can take it from opaque to fully transparent because again, it's a pure black box. There are only dark values in it. And again, if I start adding nodes and dragging around, nothing happens because no tones exist past the very left node here. 
Now, one more thing I want to note is you can see when I drag down, these are linear uh, nodes. If I turn off linear, it's going to give me a curve. And I tend to do that just to give myself the ability to create S curves and things like that. Now, you might be wondering why I wouldn't just use the opacity slider in the layer studio. And because we're working with a pure white or pure black box, that would make more sense. However, in the case of these two boxes, the magic of blend ranges is going to come into play when you start using the underlying composition ranges graph. So let's take a look at that. All right, once again, I have my white box selected and I'm going to focus on the graph on the right here. Now, again, this is going to really impact the layers beneath the source layer. So in this case, the wood texture. So let's say I want the dark tones from that texture, like between the planks here, to pull through the white box, and I want the white box to recede into the texture behind it. Well, remember, dark tones are on the left, light tones are on the right, and this is specifically impacting the layers beneath. So if I want the dark tones of the layer beneath to pull through, I'm going to drag down on this side. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see that those spaces between the planks pulled through as well as the finer textures and some of these knots, but it's not quite perfect. Let me go ahead and turn off the bounding box by hitting H and I'm going to zoom in specifically to this space between the planks. Even though I've pulled this node all the way down, you can see that there is still a little bit of a haze left and I can adjust for that by adjusting this node even further. I'm going to click on it and I'm going to start dragging to the right and I'm going to drag it just to the point where you can see that that haze no longer exists. Now at the same time that I did that though, the white of the box got knocked back a little more. Now in this case, I think it still looks fine, but if you find that it's faded it out too much, you can make further adjustments. The first thing I'm going to do is give myself the ability to use a curved spline graph. So I'll turn off linear. I'm going to click to add a node and I'm just going to start dragging up. I'm going to do it a lot just so you can see what happens. You can see that it pulls back in some, or a lot in this case, of the white tones from the box, but I don't lose the dark tones from the texture beneath it. I'm going to pull this down just a little bit. But can you see where we're starting to head with this? If I wanted to create something like a weathered paint effect, this gets me a step closer to doing that. Now what happens if I pull down on the right side here? Let's go ahead and reset this and I'll pull this right node down. Now again, the right side is going to impact the light values, and in this case, it's creating a sort of weird inverted photograph feel. Now, I wouldn't necessarily want to use this, but I could use it to, say, create a sort of putty between the two planks here. If I start dragging this over, you can see that the white of the box disappears except in between these spaces here and some of the finer cracks there. So this gives that effect as if it's sort of a caulk in between the planks. I could use this to create a snow effect on a wood roof or something like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and reset this. Let's go ahead and take a look at what happens with the black box. Okay, so I have the black box selected and I'm going to start dragging down on the left side of the underlying composition ranges. Now, just like with the white box, I'm getting that sort of inverted photo feel and this really isn't doing anything for me. I'm not really sure where I would use this in this particular case. And if I continue dragging this across, it's just going to make the box disappear. This isn't giving me the effect that I want. So I'll just go ahead and reset that. Instead, I'm gonna drag down on the right side because remember that's the light values. So it's going to pull the light values of the texture beneath this black box through and force the black box to recede into the texture behind it. So now I'm getting those nice warm tones and some of those lighter values so you can see the underlying texture layer. And if I further adjust it, it's going to make it even more so. I can go ahead and turn off my linear. Now, if I drag this way, it's going to make the black box a little darker. So in this case, I'm going to drag it this way and it's going to knock it back just a little bit more. So you can see where you want to think about what you want your final output to look like and decide which, first of all, which graph you want to use, whether it's the source layer or the underlying composition ranges. And then finally, which node is going to work best for you based on what you want it to look like. 
There's a couple more things about this dialog box that I want to mention before we move on to the next exercise. The very top here, remember that blend ranges are primarily used in Affinity Photo, and that's what this was created for. Blend gamma, anti-aliasing, and the coverage map all have to do with pixels. Since we're working with vectors here, it doesn't apply. You could shift the blend gamma around a little bit, but you're not gonna get anything different than if you just added some nodes here and made some changes. An additional thing I'll note is if you're working with a gradient or something where you want to pull reds, greens, or blues out if you have an RGB document or if any other type of color mode, it's going to give you this drop-down box, which the default is master, but you could also go into the red, green, and blue channels and just adjust those. At the very bottom here, finally, you're going to see these percentages. Now, I don't personally use these. These are going to allow you to key in a particular in percentage and out percentage for your node, so it's going to set it exactly where you want it. I find it easier just to grab the nodes and start moving them around because I can adjust it until I see exactly where I want it rather than keying something in. But again, it's something to sort of test out, play around with, and see if it works best for you. Now, one final thing I'm going to note about this before we move on to the next one is that these are vectors and these blend ranges are all non-destructive. If I don't like this black box, and let's say I want it to be a yellow box, I can simply click up here and pick a color. Now, obviously the blend ranges I chose for the black box won't work for this one. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that back up and reset it. And I can simply drag down. Again, I want to have the dark tones come through because this is a much lighter box. I'll do the same adjustment that I did with the white. I can adjust the curve even more. And all I had to do was change the color, think about what I wanted to look like, and then adjust the blend ranges to get to where I wanted. We're working with vectors and we're working with non-destructive edits. All right, so we've started touching on color, but what about if you're working with either a gradient or you're working with a group of colors and you want to apply the same blend ranges to the entire group? Let's take a look at that next. All right, so, so far we've been working with single color layers, but what if you're working with something that has multiple colors, whether it's a gradient, a texture, or a group of layers like this one. Remember, you can work at the layer level or you can work at the group le level when it comes to blend ranges. So I selected my group here and I'll open up my blend ranges. Now I have pure black and pure white here, but I also have a range of colors in between. This green being closer to white, the blue being closer to black, and then the purple somewhere in between. If I drag down on the left side of my slider, as expected, the black completely disappears because again, that's the source layer and the dark range is within it. And then the white is completely opaque. The green remains almost com uh, completely opaque, but there's slight transparency because again, it has a lot more light values in it than dark. The blue is almost transparent because it's closer to black than white. And then the purple is somewhere in between. If I go the other direction and I pull down on the right side, my white box is going to disappear. The green is almost transparent. The blue is pretty close to opaque, but you can see some slight transparency through it. And then the purple again is halfway in between. Let's take a look at the underlying composition ranges. If I drag down on the right side here with the black box, I'm getting that same sort of inverted photograph feel. And I'm sort of getting it here with the blue and the purple as well because of the dark tones in them. I am getting that nice weathered texture feel with my white, of course, and the green. And I could further adjust these nodes to get these two closer to where I want them. But I just at least wanted to show you the baseline of what would happen if I drag down this slider. Let's try the other side. Again, the black is getting me closer to where I want with that weathered paint effect. These two are a little closer, but they still sort of have that inverted photograph feel, and these even more so. The reason these do as well is because there are there is some white in these, so it's sort of forcing it to look a little bit like this. Again, I could adjust the nodes here if I wanted to, to further push it but this is just a start of understanding how it works with color. Let's take a look at a real life example as to where I would use this in designer. 
So I've pulled in this rust texture from the stock studio. Now, if you followed my work at all, you know that I don't stick to just flat vectors for the most part. I do use a lot of texture when I'm working in designer. What blend ranges are going to allow me to do with this texture is to adjust it to be exactly the way I want it. So you can see this is a really busy texture. There are a lot of highlights in here and maybe I don't want them in there. So I'm gonna go ahead and select it, go into my blend ranges and I'm going to focus on the source layer. If I want those light areas to be pulled out and made transparent, I can drop this all the way down. Now I have the wood texture on behind it so you can see that coming through because all of those lighter areas have now been made transparent. I can further push it by bringing the node to the left and I'm left with this sort of paint speckle feel. I could take this a step further by going up to the layer and changing my blend mode. So let's say I pick something like lighter color or overlay, maybe soft light. You can see I'm left with sort of a patina on the wood and I've created an entirely new background just by taking that texture and playing around with the blend ranges. Let's reset that. I can take it the opposite direction. Let me just move this back to normal and I can bring down the dark values so again, I'm making all of the dark tones in this completely opaque or transparent. I can push it even further. So I'm left with all of the light values within that texture. And I can make additional changes just by changing the blend mode. So let's say I decide to use something like maybe overlay. Again, I'm left with this feel of wood with some leftover paint and I'm given an entirely new texture to work with just by playing around with the blend ranges and blend modes on one and laying it over the top of another. All right, let's go ahead and reset this once again and take a look at the underlying composition ranges. So it's going to be pretty similar. Now, this is a pretty busy texture. So if I drag down on the light side, it's going to be difficult to see the light values of that underlying wood texture to come through. Let's go ahead and bring that back up and focus on the left side here. All right, so once again, it's forced all of the dark values of that wood texture to come through. It's pushed everything from the, the rust into that wood. It's receded in. Now this is pretty cool as it is, but again, I could take this a step further by dragging the node over. I could play around with the blend mode, let's say something like overlay or maybe soft light. So again, I've ended up with a completely different background here and a new texture to work with just by pulling in two textures from the stock studio and adjusting the blend ranges, and in this case, the blend mode on one of them. Now that begs the question, why wouldn't I just use blend mode changes? Well, let's take a look at that next. I have these two white squares that I've created, and on the left one, I'm going to change the blend mode to soft light, and that's it. On the right one, I'm going to make the same blend range adjustments that we made with the previous. I'm going to focus specifically on the underlying composition ranges and just adjust this to give it that same weathered paint effect. Now, if I turn this off and step back, you can see that the left side, the soft light blend mode, isn't quite getting me to where I want it. It still has these hazes between the planks and this texture in the finer spots here really isn't coming through, as well as the spots here in the knots. So I'd have to add a mask and mask things away, and it would take a lot to adjust it to get it to this point, if at all. Now, if I focus on the right side, you can see that I get those nice dark tones coming through, and all I had to do was adjust the graph. The problem with the right side, though, is I lose all of that warmth from the texture beneath. So if I take this blend range layer and I change the blend mode of it to soft light, I'll need to adjust some of my settings because it knocked it back a lot. I can get that weathered paint effect, but still pull through some of those nice warm tones in the texture that I lost otherwise. The same thing goes for my soft light. If it's not quite where I want it, I can go into the blend ranges and make those same adjustments. And I can get it to the point where I want. So it's not an either or thing. Soft light or any blend mode change doesn't necessarily work better than blend ranges and vice versa. You can use them in conjunction with one another to get yourself closer to the end result that you want. 
All right, so one final thing about doing this. We're working with vectors here, which are very convenient. It means you can change the colors at any time, but the problem with vectors is they're too perfect. If I'm trying to create something that looks like a weathered paint effect, the edges of these shapes are extremely straight and perfect, and it's sort of taking away from that effect. Now, for a way like this, you can't really see it, but if I were to zoom in, I'll go ahead and do that, you can see there's a very distinct line here. Now, in Affinity Photo, there's this really handy filter called Displacement, which means I can take a texture that I either pull in or already have in place, and I can displace the source layer by using that texture. Unfortunately, there isn't anything like that here in Designer, but I'm going to show you next how you can sort of work around that and create your own displacement. Okay, I have another white rectangle here and I've already added a blend range adjustment to it. But again, this is a vector shape, which means the edges are just too perfect. I wanna break them up a little bit, but there's no displacement map filter in Designer that's going to allow me to do that. So I need to create a workaround. What I'm going to do is I'm going to duplicate my layer. So I'm going to Command J on a Mac and Control J on a PC. Now that brightened it up significantly, but we're going to knock that back in a second. I'm going to change the duplicate from a fill to a stroke. And let me turn the stroke up so you can see where that's at. Now, obviously this isn't the effect I'm aiming for. What I want to do is take this stroke layer and I'm going to go into my brushes and I want to choose a textured brush that's going to give me a nice sort of broken texture around the edges. I like the dry media brushes for that. So I'm in that built-in uh, studio of brushes, dry media. I'm gonna click on this one. Now, this is not the effect I'm aiming for. We're going to adjust for this in a second. The first thing that I want to do though, is I want to clip this layer into my original shape. So I'm gonna drag it down to the right and clip it in place. You'll see everything is inside the box now. The next thing I want to do is I'm going to change the blend mode of that to erase. Now this is taking it a little too far, but you can see it's already broken up the edges. Now to adjust to bring some of that box back, with that layer selected, I'll go up to stroke and I'm going to bring my stroke down until it's where I want it. So you can sort of go back and forth until you see exactly where you want it. I'm gonna go with about 15 points here. And now if I zoom in to the very edge of this, it might be difficult to see on this texture. Let me see if I can turn off the background here. That's not gonna work. You can sort of see that it's really broken up here. Let me go ahead and make that a little bit more so, so you can see it. And that's just a nice way to sort of break up the very edges of a vector shape to give it a little bit more of a textural feel if that's what you're going for. All right, so in the next exercise, I'm going to take this group of vector letters and leaf shapes, and I'm going to create a weathered sign effect using blend ranges. All right, I want to use everything that we've talked about to this point to take this group of vector letters and shapes and create a sort of weathered painted sign effect using blend ranges. Now remember, you can add a blend range adjustment to individual layers or to a group of layers. And that's what I'm going to do in this case because I want the same blend range change for the entire thing. So I've selected my group, I'll go up to blend ranges and I'm going to adjust it the same way that I was previously. I'm only going to drag it to the point where the haze here disappears. I'll turn off linear and just bring some of that white back. All right, that was really easy. First step is done. The second step is, again, these are vectors, which means they're a little too perfect. I wanna break them up a little bit. So I'm going to duplicate this group and I want to select these five layers and I'm going to switch those to strokes. So I'm gonna take the fill and switch it to stroke. And now I want to bring it in to my layers here. I'm gonna clip these in place. So I'm gonna drag this down into the right. All right, I'm gonna get rid of this group here because I don't need it anymore. Now I want to change all of these to a stroke, change that stroke to a brush, and of course, create the erase blend mode. So I'll start with this first one. 
I'm going to first change that clipped layer to erase. I'll change the stroke to a brush. Now you're going to see something happen in a moment. It's going to make that disappear. And the reason it made it disappear is because my stroke is up really, really high, which means that texture brush is knocking it completely back. So I'm just going to drag this down until it gets to the point where I want it. Again, I want this to have sort of a broken edge, but I want to, I don't want to lose too much of the letter. I'm going to do the same thing with this next one. I'll change this to erase and you can go in any order you want. I'm just doing this in this order so you can see what happens. Again, it disappeared, but I can just go up to stroke, drag this down until I get a nice textured edge, but I get the letters back of the same. And I'm going to speed this up now and go through the rest. Okay, I've gone ahead and texturized the edges of all of my letters and all of my leaf shapes. And there's one final thing that I want to do. But first, let's take a look at the difference between this and if I turn this off and turn this one on, this is a simple soft light blend mode change. So let me go ahead and do that again. So you can see the significant difference. It's sort of getting me to where I want, but not quite. But this is getting me even closer. Now I'm not really over any of the warm tones here in the texture, so I'm not going to change the blend mode of this. I actually like where it's at. One thing I do want to do though, is I want to add some texture over the top of the entire thing and sort of break up some of this paint a little more. Let's go ahead up to the stock studio and this time I'm going to type in rust. And I think I'll pull this one in here. All right, I like how this has some nice light and dark tones. You can probably guess what I'm going to be doing next. Let's go back to our layer studio. The first thing I want to do is I'm going to delete this soft light one. We don't need that anymore. I'm going to duplicate my group of letters and leaf shapes, and I'm going to use this duplicate as a vector mask. So I'll drag this up and I'm going to clip it into place. You can see that little vertical line right next to the icon. I'll release. Now this is just showing the texture, but I want to be able to get rid of the lighter tones in this while keeping the darker tones. So I'm going to use blend ranges to do that. I'll select the layer, go to blend ranges, and this time I want to use the source layer ranges. Now, if I want to get rid of the lighter tones in the source layer, which is my texture, I want to drag down on the right side, which is the light side. So I'll drag all the way down. And you can see that I have those nice dark spots left behind but all of the light tones completely disappeared. It's a subtle change, but if I turn this off and on, you can see that it weathers it a little bit more. I might turn the blend mode, or I'm sorry, the opacity down just a touch on this. You could also play around with the blend mode in addition to the blend ranges. So let's try something like hard light. All right, let's just take a step back and see if there's any changes that need to be made. Now, this is all live text. All of the adjustments were non-destructive and we're working with vectors, which means if I want to, I can go in and change the font. I could change the colors that I'm working with. I can adjust the blend ranges even more because again, those are non-destructive. I could even change out the texture behind it and redo my blend ranges based on a new texture. I've worked completely non-destructively and because I'm working with vectors, I have the flexibility of making changes where I need to. I'd love to know in the description below if you guys have ever used blend ranges in Affinity Designer and if you have, how have you used it? Or if you have any questions, let me know below and I'm happy to help answer them. Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this tutorial about blend ranges and you wanna learn more about Affinity Designer, check out the other tutorials on my YouTube channel, including the one that I've linked here. Thanks for watching.